You ever done something wrong? You ever feel like you're a failure? Did your parents say, you really should learn from that failure? Well, interesting question. What can be learned from failure? So when we start taking a look at this, I want to go and introduce you to a man named Henry Petrosky. He's an engineer. He's a professor of engineering history at the Duke University of America. And he wrote a very interesting book called To Engineer as Human. Well, maybe some of your friends at campus might not think you're being really truly human as an engineer. But he made this comment. He says, no one wants to learn by their mistakes, but we can't learn enough from successes to get beyond the state of the art. When we have a success, we just know that we did it the right way. We don't know if we do something different, will it still be the right way? Or how far can we push a particular task or an idea or a way of doing things? And so the task of engineering is to make something useful at the lowest total cost, and that includes the cost of failure. So do we learn from failures? Yes, we should. And one thing we should do as an engineer is to always push to the level of failure to understand what happens beyond acceptable limits. Because you know what will happen? When we design something, a product, a process, a service, some customer out there will be so unique that they will be the fool who goes beyond the foolproofing of the system. They'll take it beyond the safety envelope, and something's going to happen, and we need to know what is it. If they go beyond the limits that we specified, what will happen? How gracefully does something degrade? And is it catastrophic failure if different combinations of things happen? So when we have a failure event, what can we learn? Well, first of all, we can learn the status of the operation. What was going on? What was the load on the system? What was the set of circumstances? What were the environmental effects? What was the characteristic of the material that was being used? What was the training of the operator? What was the timing of the failure and the sequence of that particular failure mechanism? What was the, the mechanism that we see itself, the cause, if you will? How often does this occur? Is it something that's predictable? Can we detect it in our systems? And this is the perspective of the external customer. Could we detect it internally before it happens? And this is the internal process customer. What's the impact of that particular failure on the job the customer wants to get done? And what's the cost and difficulty to permanently fix the failure? So there are many things we can learn by scientifically studying a failure event. Now here's a circumstance. <clears throat> we have, in this PowerPoint slide, two different factors that we put into a truth table. One is a state of knowing, and the other is a state of known. So the state of knowing is about the discovery of the fact of a field failure. Do we know we have a field failure, or don't we know we have a field failure? And the state of the known is about the discovery of the field failure. Have we known that there's a field failure out there, or we still have not discovered that there's a field failure? And what we see is there's four different conditions in a truth table here. We can have the known known, where we know that there's a failure, and we know what the cause is. We can have the unknown known, where we don't know what the state of, of the failure is, and we actually have... Uh, knowledge, or no, uh, uh, we have knowledge about the potential causes of the failure. We can have a known unknown, where we know about the failure, but we have no idea what's happening about the field failure discoveries. Or we can have the unknown unknown, we have no idea what the potential failures are, or what's going on in the field, and we have no knowledge whatsoever. Well, if we take a look at reporting information that's coming to us from customer, we can see there can be multiple episodes of failure. Failure due to cause one, due to cause two, due to cause three. Failure cause one, episode one here, may be a known historical field failure event. We know what's happening and we can predict it because we have good scientific data. Episode two may be a partially discovered field failure event. We've seen it happening. We know some of the circumstances. We don't know the extent of it and we don't know how many customers it actually engaged. However, episode three are the unknown, undiscovered field failure events. There may be a flaw lurking in the product, an error that hasn't been detected. It hasn't moved forward to the point where it's created any impact that's detectable in the field. But it's sitting there still silent and waiting to happen. And if that is very severe in terms of the outcome, 
but very improbable in terms of events. We have a very difficult time in interpreting and understanding, is that actually going to happen? So management is going to ask some questions about field failures. And what they want to know is, what's the current state of knowledge we have about the failure events and their mechanisms? What's the risk exposure we have to those unknown, unknown field failure events in the future? What's the cost impact from the currently known failures? And how do we estimate the potential impact of new events when we discover them, in terms of what is actually going to be the impact of that in future states? How rapidly can a field failure episode be detected and corrected so that it doesn't have long-term impact on the cash flows of the organization due to warranty and recovery of the customer's defects? How do we, do we manage an emerging field failure episode? What's the process of discovery? How do we go back and then mitigate the circumstance so those field failures don't actually have a big impact on the customer or on the finances of our company? Another management question is, what strategy should be taken to remedy these episodes? Is it on-site repair? Is it replacement of the unit? Do we manage it by our service strategy? Or is it part of the maintenance strategy we have? So all of those are important questions that we should be thinking about, actually, during the design of the process. And this is one of the reasons why, when we start looking at this, there are some analytic problems that can be masked in our reporting systems. So I've looked at many different field failure reporting mechanisms. And as I look at them, I start seeing there are some real problems with them. For instance, many of them report enumerative data. And so I see all of the field failures, and it's grouped by year, and it's grouped by region. And then within each of those years, I see the reports of the failure. And maybe then they're further broken down by type of failure. But those are enumerative data. It's tabular information. I'm seeing the summary. And when I'm taking a look at those, I don't understand the relationship among the field failure conditions. I don't really understand when they occurred in time. And by looking at the summary, it's usually presented as percentage data. And so I see 100%, but what happens if there are a million products out there? The round-off error in percentage when there are a million products out there is 10,000 units. That's 10,000 customer experiences of failure that I'm missing because of decimal place misplacement. Another thing is, do I really know the current level of reported field failure episodes? Yes, maybe I do in terms of a summary, but I don't really understand the predicted rate of change. So I go from level to level, from block to block, year to year, quarter to quarter, but I don't see really rate of change that is actually naturally occurring in the field at the point of use of that equipment. So this enumerative summary of reported field failure conditions isn't really a good basis for a prediction of future events or for estimating risk and liability for future failures. Enumerative data values historical uh, data equally with the current data. So I take a look and I see, well, my data from 2012 is also in the same data set with my 2014. Which one has more effect on me? An old failure that may be corrected or a new one that's coming up and just emerging? So, we can only, when we use an analytic perspective or a time-based perspective, as we get with individuals' charts, really understand this presentation of new failure occurrences. And then that episode data of particular failures becomes a rational subgroup, worthy of understanding and analyzing. And that data can then be used to create a trend and then forecast the impact. Now, interestingly enough, what we do know about failures is that they tend to follow what's called a Weibull distribution in statistics. So a Weibull distribution is a statistical distribution that has shape. And you actually see it, sometimes it's called the bathtub distribution. And what we see is in the life cycle of a product that many times there is an initial start of failure. And so the failure is sometimes called infant mortality. This infant mortality is a weakness in the design or a weakness in the manufacturing quality that doesn't come out until it's actually put into use in the field. Maybe it occurs in the first several hundred hours of operation of the product. And we see this infant mortality, and we see that it is usually exponentially de uh, de decreasing as we see the life cycle of the product because it's wearing out, if you will. All of those features are dying. And then we go to a flat period. In the flat period of the distribution, that's like the bottom of the bathtub, 
we see a normal distribution, and that is that randomly occurring errors. And so as we were talking about this a while ago, we talked about average run length. This would be where we would see just, if you will, that noise factor. We should only see like one out of 400 things occurring because it's just very random. There is no pattern detectable in those types of failures. However, at a certain point in time, everything starts wearing out. It's kind of like our bodies, you know. We start saying, okay, we're getting towards end of life in the body. You know, I can feel it in my joints. I feel it in my body. I can't get up in the morning. Wait a minute. You students have that trouble too, so it's not the end of your life, so don't worry about it. Okay. But as you get to older, like in my state, you start seeing, okay, things are moving up, and now we're getting this increasing effect. And that's the end of life. They call it the obsolescence or the wear-out phase. And in that wear-out phase, again, we see now a monotonically increasing distribution, uh, and it can also be exponential. We add the three together, we're going to see this bathtub-shaped curve. <clears throat> If all failures are not divided into risk and exposure segments, then all of the failures are confounded. We see them all together. So if I'm looking at this analytic uh, view of data, I see it in the time series. If I'm looking at the enumerative data in a, in a tabular format, all the failures are happening all at once. I can't see which episodes are we dealing with, which episodes have been cleared, how are the clearing ones decreasing, how are the new ones increasing, and what's actually happening. I'm really only being able to act, uh, ex extract from that information sort of the steady state impact of what's going on. That's good enough, perhaps, for making an estimate, on average, what's going to be our warranty cost. But it doesn't tell us about what it would really be as a good basis for predicting warranty costs very far into the future. So early detection has to compare actual failures observed to a random failure model and determine, does this infant mortality system exist? Now, there's an in interesting implication for engineers here. When we're involved in designing a new product or a process for creating a product or a service, it's only by testing that product or process to the point of failure during its design that we can possibly understand all the mechanisms of failure that may be encountered once it's deployed for full-scale implementation. And what that means is that when we're designing a process or a product, we have to push it and test it to the point of failure so we know what happens in those failure events. Maybe repair it again and test it some more. What's the second event or the second failure mode that occurs? Now, what you've learned in many of your schools is that what we do is we test to what's called acceptance limits. So acceptance limits are marketing-induced. They're basically the promise that we're going to make to the customer. If I'm making a watch, I say this watch will operate to 30 meters in terms of water resistance. So I test it to 30 meters. Well, that actually provides a marketing saying, yes, it will test to 30 meters, and it's done this all well, you know, all, for all of our testing, so it meets the acceptance test criteria. But as an engineer, I'm very curious, at what point in time will it leak? Does it leak at 30.5 meters? And does it leak at, at 90 meters? And what is the relationship between the two? What is the curve of the degradation of its failure? Because many times the customer is not going to be knowing how many meters if they're down in the water, you know, and it's a depth charge or a depth gauge, do they actually understand what's going on? So we have to understand what is the condition and test so that we make sure the product is viable throughout its useful life to the performance level that we had. And when something goes wrong, we know how it's going to fail and how it will affect the customer. And by doing that analysis, we're going to protect that customer through our engineering to make sure we have safeguarded the performance so that no hazardous conditions can come about. Well, we're going to come back and think a little bit more about failure analysis because things have changed now here in 2015. We have a new version of ISO 9000. It's changed the definition of risk and failure. And so we have to think, how do we actually analyze this more effectively for the future? And this is, if you will, new knowledge that's just being created because the systems have changed.